Okay, good afternoon everybody. All, all set for, uh, for another session? Had a good break, I hope. Um, okay, uh, nice that you're here. The session uh, today will be, this session will be about secure development life cycles. The idea of this session is uh, twofold. The goal is, in, is twofold. Uh, first of all, the idea is to give you uh, a bit of insight on what is secure development life cycles. What is it? What can we do with it? What are different models? And the second goal is also to discuss a bit with you. Um, have you been using this in practice? Um, are you aware of it? Are you, do you, are you facing any problems within your organization to do secure development life cycle, to do secure development in general? Um, so that's for the second part. We can see how much, uh, how much um, discussion we have on that. I have enough material to cover the entire session, so it's a bit based on you where you want to go. But first of all, the first goal is definitely to, uh, to, to present to you the, the topic of secure development life cycle. <clears throat> so first of all, uh, who am I? So my name is uh, Bartowin. I've uh, been working uh, for over 15 years in uh, information security uh, industry. I spent quite a bit of time in um, University of Leuven, where I uh, actually a couple of colleagues uh, <laughs> I know from there. Um, since a uh, year five or so, since 2009, I joined uh, commercial companies to work on secure software. Um, I am <coughs> um, currently working at PwC Belgium where I'm responsible for all services related to secure software. So I coordinate uh, penetration tests, but I also help companies in improving their uh, practices regarding secure software development. And so that's, that's uh, the topic of today um, on, on this uh, secure development life cycles. If you want to contact me uh, after the session, uh, my email address is at the bottom. So feel free to, uh, to uh, ask me any questions after, after, after the fact as well. Uh, this was a bit of, of myself. Um, I would first like to, to know a bit what, what profiles are in the room, just to make sure that we have the, the discussions that we, that we might have, that, that I know what backgrounds that you have. So um, I, are there any developers in the room? Um, one developer? Uh, yeah, one developer security engineer. Okay. Any um, analysts? Um, any uh, testers, QA, QA people, um, managers on, 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 on software development, Talking managing, consulting, consulting. Managing okay. Directly. I'm counseling and I'm coaching uh, developers and okay. for development tooling and infrastructure. Yeah, okay. Any other consultants? Internal consultant. Yeah, oh, internal consultant. Okay, and those are, okay. And we've missed, uh, so what's your, what's your profile? Student or, or, okay, okay, yeah, okay. So we have a bit of uh, everything actually in the room, which is, uh, which is okay, um, which is good actually. Um, so the agenda for this session is the following. First, I would like to uh, discuss with you what's the motivation uh, to look into software development life cycles. Uh, so there's a lot of technical uh, material that's being discussed during this week. Um, software development life cycle um, is maybe perceived as a bit less technical topic, which it is, but in the same time, which it isn't, because you can go very technical with this. Um, but so what's the reason for, for, for looking into this, uh, 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 into this topic? Why do we do this actually? Um, after that, um, once we set that clear, I want to look into, into two different types of models. Um, one, well, the first one is a process model. And I will look, uh, the, the goal of that, of that part is to look into one particular model, the Microsoft SDL model, because it gives a very good overview of, uh, of software development life cycle, security development life cycle. What is it? What type of activities do we typically do into, in, into, those, uh, into those models? Um, and the second type model is the maturity models. Um, more recently, there's different types of models that have been, that have been um, set up more related to the maturity models. And maturity modeling is, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with maturity model, but modeling, but it's, it's, a, it's a way of, of uh, interpreting how well an organization or a group is performing uh, concerning a particular domain. So it's not really a process, it's more like measuring the maturity and how can we improve, in, uh, improve that in that direction. Um, the, after that, I want to, um, um, do, do a bit more discussion about these models 
And um, there's, there's a part on implementation tips and challenges. What I want to do there is, okay, now once you know how these models work, uh, process models and maturity models, how can you go about implementing these models in an organization? What are, the, what are the typical steps that you're taking? Uh, what are the pitfalls? What are the, the things to do? And what, what are things not to do? And that's actually really the part where we can have a lot of uh, discussion based on your experience, uh, on, your, on your problems that you face in, in your organization, um, uh, in your day-to-day -day organization. Um, and so we can, we can have then discussion parts and that's, that's the agenda for the session. That's okay? Hi, that's the content, so I hope it's okay. Okay, uh, so application security. What's the problem there? And actually, it's very well uh, illustrated by the, this Dilbert cartoon, um, which states that um, um, business always demands for particular things in software. Um, functionality, it must be delivered rapidly, it must be delivered perfectly correct uh, with the least amount of money that you, that, that you have um, or that they are willing to spend. Um, and so, um, if, you really, if you really want to make it fast, uh, if you really want to develop in a fast way, in a, in a, in a fast way um, chances are that you're going to make errors or you're going to neglect particular problems in the software. Security is one of these problems. Security is often called a non-functional requirement because it's not really related to the functionality, but it's rather about the quality of the software. How, the, how should it behave in case of particular situations in the software? Um, and of course, um, what's the problems that we face in developing secure software? Uh, first of all, there's software complexity. If you would compare the software about of 20 years ago with the today's software, the complexity is, is a magnitude of uh, much more complex than, than it was uh, used to be 20 years ago. It's also much more connect, connected uh, compared to 20 years ago. You, at at uh, today's uh, software, you never build a software in isolation. You will always build a piece of software that is connecting to other pieces of software. And you have to make sure that all these interfaces are secured as well. And so the, if, there's, if you're connecting with one uh, unsecure part, uh, piece of software, you have to kind of figure out what the impact would be on your part of the software system. Um, you have, you have uh, different types of, uh, you have different, a lot of technology stacks. Um, we, uh, I often work in organizations where there's multiple technology stacks that they're implementing. They're using, using uh, Java-based systems, .NET-based systems, they have uh, mainframe systems, they have all these different types of systems together. And you have secured not only one application, you have to secure the, the entire application portfolio on these different technology stacks. And that's really a challenge, uh, because doing it on one technology stack in itself, it's already a challenge, be alone, let, let alone uh, all these different technology stacks. Of course, uh, business always demands better adaptable software, uh, faster software, just better software, more functionality, more rapidly delivered. It's really a very, a very a difficult thing to do uh, in, in, in practice. And so often security is a bit over, overlooked or there's just not, no time to, uh, to really look into, soft, in, into security. And that's a problem that we're faced with. Um, so it's not always a technical problem. So um, you, when, you, when you read about secure software, one of the things that you will definitely see is like cross site scripting or SQL injection. That's definitely an important part of the, of the puzzle. But it's not the only part of the puzzle. There's a lot more things to do than, uh, to security than that, to secure software than that. Uh, all the, the things like business logic attacks, for instance, one, one perfect example. Business logic attack really attacks the, the, the logic, the business logic inside the software rather than a technical uh, implementation flaw in the software. So you have to look at the business, the business functionality in the software and also how it's being built. So you have the technical side, business side, and also the, the process side. And those are three different dimensions of building secure software. And you actually have to focus on, on, on all three of these. So a lot of complexity, um, we have to deal with that. And actually secure development life cycles will help you deal with this, with this problem. Uh, then, okay, you, you know that application security is important, otherwise you wouldn't be here in this course. Um, but some statistics, um, uh, depending on the source that you, that you read, um, one of the sources I read is that 75% uh, of the vulnerabilities today are actually application related. So more and more organization better control the systems and the network that are in place, but the software is still a very weak part because it's so complex to get secure. And that's where most of the vulnerabilities are situated. Uh, you can read these reports of uh, Verizon Business, for instance, has this report on the, on the yearly report on vulnerability statistics. White Hat Security has these reports. You should read them to figure out how important application security is. But, but you know that by now, otherwise you wouldn't be here.
But so it's an important problem and it's not easy to solve. So what's, um, what's the typical nature of application security as a problem? Um, there's two things that I want to tell you. First of all, there's a difference between bugs and flaws. I don't know if you heard about this uh, of, or if you read it before, but, but uh, Gary McGraw uh, makes, ma has made once the difference between bugs and flaws, and I think it's an interesting one. A bug is really something that you, that you uh, make by mistake during the implementation phase, like a SQL injection problem. It's typically a bug in the software. You, you encode the query to the database, you encode it, you, you uh, create it in the incorrect way, okay, and boof, you have, an, you have a security problem. But that's really, that's really a bug, an, an, a very small mistake that you make in the, in, in the creation of your software system. While a flaw is more like a logical, prob a logical problem in your software. You have uh, a system, you're, you have a lot of functionality, but you have omitted that um, when you do a particular function in the system, it might lead to an impact on the overall system. It's like these typical things, um, the, 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 the Kinepolis example, for instance, the cinema example. Uh, you have these online systems where you can create, where you can register seats for a cinema. Kinepolis had, had that problem. Um, so they, they create a system and they just allow people to reserve a seat. And you have to pay for that seat and then you get the seat. Now, if you don't think this through and you, um, you allow people to reserve the seat without paying for it and just um, blocking the seat, then you might have a lot of non-paying members just blocking seats and the entire room is not taken, but you have non-paying members, non-paying uh, people in, in the room. That's more like a, like a flaw that you, just, that you, that you should think about during the, during, the, during the setup, what's the functionality of the system. And that's more like a flaw. Flaws are also more architectural, architecture based. It's not an implementation detail, it's more like what's the architecture of the software and what's, um, what's the, what, what can go wrong there. How do you connect different systems together, these kind of things. Now it turns out that um, in software, bugs and flaws are almost represented 50-50, meaning that there's as many bugs in system as there are flaws in system, uh, which is kind of surprising. Um, and actually it's kind of hard to believe the statistic, but they've done uh, tests on, on software uh, to, try to, uh, to, try to, to, to try to evaluate that. And so if you think about all the SQL injection problems in your software, there's probably as many flaws in the system as there are SQL injection problems in the system, which is kind of an, a, a, large, a large amount of, uh, am amount of problems in there. And so the, the, the thing is that the, the focus of bugs is typically in the later stages of the software life cycle, while the focus on flaws is typically in the earlier stages of the life cycle. That's one thing. That's important to, to, to think about. A second thing relates to the cost of fixing a vulnerability in software. Um, the, the, a lot of research has shown that, and it's, it's kind of logic to, uh, to, to, to hear, a lot of research has shown that the later you wait with fixing a vulnerability in your software, the, costly, the costlier it becomes. And why is that the case? It's, it's very, very simple. If you wait until deployment or maintenance phase, and you, you, uh, you figure out that to solve a particular vulnerability, you have to actually change the architecture. You have to go all the way back again into the software process, fix it there and redo the entire thing that we have done before. So as sooner, the sooner you identify a particular problem in your software, the, the cheaper it, it is to, uh, to fix it. And that's an important argument to really think about security during the entire life cycle. Okay, so what do we see in practice? I'm a consultant myself. Um, what do we typically see? We do a lot of penetration tests. What do we typically see? People follow, uh, often people follow the penetrate and patch approach, meaning they just wait for things to happen. And when things happen, they come to us and they say, oh, apparently we have a problem. We have been hacked. Can you figure out what's going on? Okay, clearly that's not the way to do it. Um, more and more companies tend to uh, start with penetration testing. So they built an entire system and just before, right, just before deploying it, they hire an external company or they have internal people to do penetration on the software, penetration testing on the software, which is, which is kind of okay already because you, at, at that moment at least you identify that there's particular problems in the software. But this is not so ideal from a, from a cost perspective, as I said before, because if you wait just before deployment, if you find uh, important things, it will be costly to fix. Companies more and more start to think about architectural reviews. Um, 
but that's 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 a minority of companies I'd say because often when we come to a, uh, we come come uh, to a client and we ask what's the architecture of the software it's often difficult for them to describe what the architecture actually is let alone that they actually review what the architecture should be so more people uh, organizations start to do this but it's not so often in practice so <coughs> Doing these activities, especially penetrate and patch, or waiting too late, it's, it's a problem from a cost perspective, but also from a vulnerability perspective. Because if you, if you identify here a particular SQL injection problem, and you fix that problem, how do you know for sure that there's no other SQL injection problem in the software? That's really difficult to do. You never, you're never sure that when fixing one particular instance, that there will be no others. And actually, there, there's high chance that there will be others in the software. Otherwise, you, would have, you wouldn't have made the, the mistake in the first place. So, <clears throat> um, the longer you wait and the longer you, you don't think about security, the higher uh, chances are that, that you will have problems in your software related to, to, to security. So, and that's the entire idea of SDLC. SDLC is actually just this. Take your secure de software development lifecycle from inception, analysis through design, implementation, testing, and just try to make sure that you do all the necessary things that, that are important for build, building secure software. That's the basic idea of, of SDLC. And it's, uh, it's, it has a good cost argument. It will, uh, it will uh, deliver better, better quality software. It will make it more efficient. Uh, and one of, one, of the uh, one of the interesting things as well, um, it should focus on security functionality as well as security hygiene. What do I mean by that? Security functionality is like um, authentic you build a security function in your software. You, do, you build authentication in there. You build authorization in there. You do encryption. That's a security function. While security hygiene is just making sure that you're not making mistakes that, that might lead to security vulnerabilities. A SQL injection problem is just typically linked to security hygiene because you just you, you've implemented a piece of code that is not perfect from a security uh, perspective and that will introduce security vulnerabilities in your software. So you should focus on those two. Okay. Yep. So um, it, starts, it starts in the analysis phase or yeah. is the analysis and also um, um, capture the, like the business phase? <coughs> well, yeah. Yeah, you, you typically have yeah kind of project project inception phase where you define what's the problem that I want to solve, and then you have a requirements phase. Now it can be that there are two different phases here, or that that you just take it into one phase. But even in the in the the project inception phase, it it makes already sense to think about security. What's the problem, and are there any, are there any risks involved in that uh, or linked to that problem? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And less to security hygiene, or is that yeah, a yeah, yeah, that's that's uh, when you think about requirements in the beginning, you typically think about security functionality. Yeah. So, um, can anybody use the system that I'm building? Um, you will you have an answer yes or no, and that will typically lead to a security functionality requirement. It's less. Uh, it makes less sense to explicitly um, state security hygiene requirements. I should not code SQL injection problems in my software. It doesn't make sense to, to, to take that as a, as a requirement. So in the, in the initial phases of your software, you typically think more about security functionality. That's, that's correct. Okay, so what are the uh, objectives then of SDLC? So now that you know that it's something that goes through in the entire life cycle, uh, the objectives are, and it's, it's a long sentence, um, I've indicated the words that are important in bold. It's, it's uh, to develop uh, and maintain software in a consistent and efficient way with a demonstrable and standards compliant security quality in line with the organizational risks. But all the keywords in bold are actually important to build secure software. And you will see later on that, that we're actually trying to do that when, when uh, implementing SDLC uh, uh, projects or, or uh, strategies in a company. Uh, consistency just means when I'm building software now and I'm building software in a year, the security quality should be consistent. When I'm giving a software to one developer or to another developer, it should be consistent. It shouldn't matter when or by whom the software is being built, the outcome of the security 
should more or less be the same. It will never be the same in practice, but at least it should not be like that. It should not, the, the difference shouldn't be huge, because then you have a problem. Then you can never predict what's going to happen. It should be efficient. Um, you, you should prepare your organization in such a way that it can build secure software in an efficient way. Not for every piece of software that you're building, rethink the entire security thing. How should I protect against SQL injection? What are the security requirements in the software? If you, if you have to rethink every time all the security um, problems, it will take a lot of energy. So SDLC is also about make this just more efficient. Prepare a lot of these things in advance so that you can build secure software in a more efficient way. It should be demonstrable, uh, meaning that you should somehow be able to, to, uh, to um, demonstrate that the software is secure or that, that it has been built according to the, the standards that you, that you expect it to be, to be uh, adhering. Um, if you do a pen test on software, how many vulnerabilities are in there? If you do it um, with SDLC or without SDLC, is there a lot of difference? If not, then you're probably your SDLC is not really, really great or beforehand you were already a very good performing organization. But you should have some way of measuring this. It should be standards compliant. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's again about building these standards in the organization. Um, and, and you should make sure that you have the standards lying around and that you can just give them to the software uh, developers, software testers, that they make sure that, they, that they're complying with that. And the most important one, it should be about risks. You shouldn't be uh, building Fort Knox applications for every application that you're building in an organization. It only relates to the risk that the application faces or, or gives to the organization. If you're building a financial system with high transaction, high, high uh, amount of transactions, um, it's, it's, it's wise to invest a lot of security, in, uh, a lot of effort into security. If you're building an, uh, just a portal to share common information or whatever, don't, in, don't invest too much security effort into that. It doesn't make sense. The effort will not like you, uh, will not like you, you won't get the money, and there's no risk to the organization, so why do it? So it always has to, in line, uh, has to be in line with the, the, the risks that the, application, uh, uh, that, you've, that the application faces towards the organization. That's an important one. <clears throat> Any questions so far? Okay? Yeah? I will, I will wait for the end of the presentation. Okay. <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> it's very kind of you. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> I will talk about different SDLC models, uh, but uh, in my opinion, and I'm definitely not the only one, um, there's different cornerstones that are relevant in SDLC. And um, I've, I, I list the cornerstones in, in this slide. There's actually six of them. Here is the only four. And again, this will make more sense, hopefully, after the presentation, after this session. But I'm going to already explain this and keep this in, in your minds when I'm, when I'm talking about the different models um, later in the session. These are the four basic cornerstones of SDLC uh, in organization, of secure development uh, in organization. There's a people cornerstone. What are the different people, in my, different persons in my organizations? What are the roles they have and what are their responsibilities? Are they responsible for security or not? Who is responsible for security? That's that basic question. So who am I dealing with and who is responsible for this? There's the process part. That's of course a very important one. I already il illustrated the process part before. You will see that the models also uh, put a focus on the process part. So if you have a development process, how should they enhance it to make sure that you cover security activities in that process? Uh, so you have activities, we have control grades to make sure that you verify whether they are, they are correctly implemented or not. Uh, so that's the process part. The knowledge part, uh, that, that has to do with standards and all these uh, standards, methodologies, guidelines. How are you going to build this? Um, does, the, does the organization sufficiently know how to build it? Does the organization know what a cross-site scripting attack is? If, they do, if, they don't, if developers don't know what it is, they will surely not fix it. They will not prevent it. So that all um, has to do with knowledge. You have to build the knowledge within the organization to make sure that they know how to do things. Yeah. Transfer methods. Is it in-house training or Yeah. How to, uh, yeah, n n not yeah, training, but we see it's, it's a different, uh, it's a different um, cornerstone. But indeed, it's how to make sure that people know um, how, how they know this. But it's not only about training, it's also about communication. Eh? 
if you change the standards, people should know about this. So you have, a, you have to have a communication plan in, in, in place to make sure that people know that. And the last one is tools and components. You can try to do everything by hand, but it will not work. If you do a standard static analysis, um, and you will do it by hand, if you want to do code review by hand, for a piece of software containing uh, 100,000 lines of code, you will pretty soon realize that it's not, not really uh, the best way to do it. Uh, so you have to have tools to, for development, uh, for assessment and for management. Management typically also wants to make sure how to see how security is evolving. If you're building an application, how well is application being built? If I, if I have to release in one year, am I on track? If I have to release in, in three months, am I on track? And pe management people typically wants to have that, that, that view on, on, on the matter. Um, so you will have to, when implementing an SDLC in an organization, you will have to make sure that all these uh, cornerstones are covered. But there's actually two more that are very important. The risk one, I discussed that already. Only do things if they're uh, in line with the risks that, that the application faces towards the organization. So you have to really control the risk uh, for the organization. And then the training one. Once you did all the, the, the basic cornerstone, you have to make sure that you train people to know how to do this. And for every, for every organization, you have to uh, think about those six cornerstones. Um, otherwise, it will not work. If you forget about the tools and components, you will see that in practice, it won't fly. If, if you forget about the process, again, it won't fly. People won't know what to do. This is really a very, very important uh, slide in the, yeah. No, not at all. Well, typically, every, every, hopefully, every software development company has, has a standard process uh, to build things. Um, but it's often not the case that this process is really tailored for security. It's typically a basic standard, either a waterfall model or an agile model. Uh, these typically standard development processes. We don't see that often that it's tailored towards, towards security. The 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 tool builders, you mean, or within the bank? Within the bank, yeah. We buy softwares yeah. developed by mm -hmm. companies, yeah. And we want to be sure that they are secure, uh, secure applications. The the applications that you buy, yes. yeah, yeah. It's a very interesting point, and actually, it's one point that we should we should. Uh, you should keep it for discussion because it's an, in, an important and interesting point. <coughs> so remind me of it when I, uh, when I forget about it in discussion, but really uh, remind me. Okay, some statistics again. Gardner uh, in 2006, way back when uh, computers are just invented, were just invented, more or less. Um, they, they predicted that um, organizations with a proper SDLC will experience a very um, high decrease in critical vulnerabilities, like 80%. Um, it would be interesting to, uh, to try to uh, evaluate companies nowadays to see for the companies they did that did SDLC, um, whether that's really the case. But they, they press some very high uh, psi, uh, advantages for the organizations. And also, uh, when you reduce by 50% in vulnerabilities, you will uh, um, actually reduce quite a bit of costs in incident management, uh, configuration management, these kind of things. Um, a lot of it, things has to do with the fact that there's much less vulnerabilities, but also that things, software development is much better under control. And when it's better under control, it will be easier and you will reduce costs. That's, that's a bit the argument there. So does it work? Good question. Um, one of the important companies in, in SDLCs is uh, Microsoft with their uh, secure development lifecycle. And they have, they have published a number of statistics. Um, they have applied this. So Microsoft has this, um, had this, uh, the, the, I don't know if you have heard the, the history of the trustworthy computing in Microsoft, but in 2002, 2003, I think somewhere, Bill Gates published an important nota, uh, a memo, saying that from now on, every software being developed should be uh, in line with the trustworthy. People, exp clients expect from us that we create secure software. Uh, we should do that. Based on that memo, they internally started to figure out, okay, how to do that. They built their own SDL model, and they've been uh, building uh, software using that model since 2004, 2005. So what I saw 
um, is, um, wait, let me show some, some statistics here. For instance, SQL Server. Eh? SQL Server 2000 was before the SDL uh, era in, in Microsoft. And SQL Server 2005 was after the SDL, uh, uh, after the introduction of the SDL in the company. And there you typically, you, you already see quite a, quite a lot that, that the, the decrease in vulnerabilities was, was quite, uh, quite enormous. Um, whether that means that here they didn't find all vulnerabilities, vulnerabilities? yeah, that's probable. Probably don't know it. But here they probably don't know all the vulnerabilities either. So all the things that they know about the software, there's quite a bit of decrease in the number of vulnerabilities. They did the same for operating systems. Um, so XP, Windows XP and Windows Vista, for instance. Of course, you can argue that the functionality of Vista is different than XP, which is correct. But still, the number of vulnerabilities that they, that they identified after release is quite a bit less for Vista than it is for XP. So which indicates that they're, they're doing quite a bit of progress in that, in that, in that domain. Um, <clears throat> That's, that's difficult to say in practice. Uh, the umbrella under which they capture all their... Yeah, but these are, these are statistics. So they have an, an SDL program that, 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 that they publish. So they, they and also explain why they do it and why they do specific things. And those are statistics that they also give in, in the context of that program. Um, it might be the case that there's other things available, uh, things, measures taken that m might reduce this. But uh, take into account that uh, Microsoft is an, uh, an ISV. So they just produce software and they ship it. They don't install it themselves. This is about really uh, software uh, that's being built and shipped towards the customer. And so in that, um, there's quite a bit of a uh, difference in the, in the, the pre and the post SDL, SDL uh, uh, phase in, in Microsoft. And a lot of this will have to do with, uh, with Microsoft because you see the, as, you, as you will see later, they spend quite a bit of effort in, 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 this, uh, in this. Okay. <clears throat> Some, um, since the memo of Bill Gates and, 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 and other initiatives, there's a lot of initiatives that have been started actually. Um, and there's, there's, there's one, uh, few, few of them on the slide. There's more than this, but I think these, are, these capture the, the most important ones. Um, so actually there's different categories of, of, um, of SDLC uh, um, initiatives as well. So for the first one is you, you have these process models. So Microsoft SDL, CLASP, the NIST one, Touchpoint, these are all process models. Yeah? They describe what the process should look like. Then you have the maturity models. These are um, BSIM, SAM, SSE, CMM, those are maturity models. Again, I will explain one example of that. And these are more, um, these are more principles and, and how, to, how to address things. It's not really in a process or maturity model, but so for instance, these are the GASP, these are principles, generally accepted security principles, security software principles. They, don't, they don't, don't give you direct advice on how to do things, they just say you should take that principle into account when building secure software. <coughs> Nowadays, you will see that the, the, the large organizations um, have their own SDL process in place. So we've had talks at, at OASP uh, on um, Dell, on Oracle. The large companies have in their development process a security component, an important security component in place. And how do they do that? We'll come back later to that. Okay, so this about the motivation and to give you some uh, idea about What's, what's, the different, uh, what's the context and what's the different models. So now um, let's, let's uh, go into the process models. Oh, any, any other questions uh, on, the, on the, the first part session? Everything is clear? Okay. So <coughs> let's, let's talk about process models. So the focus of this process model is, is more about what's the actual process that you should use when developing secure software. And I think a very interesting example in this case is Microsoft SDL. Um, there's different process models, you have CLASP, you have touchpoints, you have others. Uh, but why is it so important? Uh, first of all, it's been used heavily. It's been used by Microsoft and by Microsoft partners to develop secure software. And if you think Microsoft, okay, that's already quite a bunch of development going on. So it's being practice proven, let's put it that way, 
it's being used in practice. <coughs> um, another one that I wanted to point out, but I can't, <laughs> I can't uh, remember it, so it will come back uh, in a minute or so. Um, so what are we what are we discussing here? Um, what they've what they've uh, defined is an is a process model that has the following um, structure, and I will go over each of the phases uh, in the next slides. Uh, but so they have a process model that's uh, covering the different the different phases in typical software development lifecycle, from requirements, design, implementation, verification, these kind of things. What do they say? For every phase in development lifecycle, you have different activities that you should be doing. Mm -hmm. In the requirements phase, you should think about security requirements, kind of logic, logical. But you should also think about other. Um, I, will, I will explain them uh, in, in, just, after, just after this. Uh, what's important about this model is, first of all, uh, at this moment, this model seems to focus a bit on security. Um, what they've realized at Microsoft uh, over the last years is that actually privacy is also a very important one. So at one hand you have security, at the other end you have privacy. You don't see a lot of privacy activities in there, but they've actually um, geared their model towards privacy as well. So actually they have a model that works for both security and privacy. And you will see in a lot of these activities that there's actually the security component in there, that's the security functionality, but also a privacy component what data might leak from the application and how can we address that. So that's, that's for a lot of these activities uh, the case. Um, <clears throat> second thing is, um, they have, um, if you want to have the name SDL compliant, Microsoft SDL compliant, you should implement all these activities. Not only three, not only five, all these activities. Only then, they give you, they, 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 you can claim yourself as being SDL compliant. There's actually optional activities outside of this uh, set of activities that you could do. These are the mandatory ones. And only if you, have, if you do them in a reasonable or in a good, in a high quality way, you can claim yourself as being SDL compliant. Uh, to my knowledge, they don't have really an, an, an evaluation of that, um, but they do have kind of a model, um, you could call it a maturity model, where they also try to measure how well you're implementing a particular activity. So in that sense, they can try to analyze or evaluate if you're doing activity and how well you're doing it. Um, I will go over the, um, the, the model now, one by one. Uh, yeah? So they only assess based on the, uh, on the process, do they also assess the outcome, like how many security incidents are basically present in the software that <coughs> Yeah, well, SDL is a process model. And the, 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 the process models typically focus more on, on what's the process that you're actually using to build. And so that's also the reason why they, of course, when they execute the process within Microsoft, they will look a lot at how many vulnerabilities are there for a particular application. But the process model itself more focuses on the activities and how you implement the activities. Okay, um, so let's, let's go through it. Um, you will see that uh, the next slides are not a perfect one to mam mapping with the model that I've just shown, but it's the, the slides here uh, discuss more how Microsoft implemented it uh, in, within Microsoft themselves. So there's actually a number of other activities that join, that, that group some of these activities, or they do some extra things as well. But in, in on, on, on the global level, it, it corresponds to the, to the actual model. So the training part, that's the easy part. Um, remember, training is one of the five cornerstones. They, what do they typically train within Microsoft? They train different kind of courses. They have courses on threat modeling, courses on secure uh, design, security testing, these kind of things. They have these courses. They typically have also a way uh, to, uh, to, to uh, so all developers within Microsoft should follow these trainings. If, you, if, you're, uh, if you're a Microsoft developer, you must have had it to, to be able to build in, uh, to, to, to develop software within Microsoft, which is already quite a, quite, a, quite a big thing. Because if you go to most development organizations, this is not the case. Most, most developers are not trained within, uh, for, for, for security. 
Um, so why do, why do uh, Microsoft give this training to, uh, to, to people in the organization? It's first of all to know the trends. What is going on in security? Are there any new vulnerabilities? Um, what, what are the new security features coming in the market? How, how should we de uh, defend against these? But also the, really to know the problems. What is like SQL injection? What is cross-site scripting? And what should we do exactly to defend against these? Now these trainings are role-specific, role, uh, so they are giving different trainers, uh, trainings to developers than to managers. The perspective that they're giving as training is, is different, uh, which is also, of course, uh, an interesting thing to do. You shouldn't be telling a manager how, how to uh, create a prepared statement to, to, uh, to, to solve SQL injection. That's, that's, that's a developer thing, it's not, it's not a management thing. So they adapt these trainings really to the, to the particular target audience. So <coughs> at the requirements phase, what do they do? Uh, first of all, there's a, a project inception phase um, where they um, do several things. Um, they have um, advisors that are being assigned to a project. So when a project starts, they always uh, assign responsibilities, security responsibilities within the project. So they have a, resp a project responsible, which is typically from in the team, and they have an advisor, which is typically outside of the project team, that are responsible of making sure that the, the security within the project is being met. The role of the security responsible is really to, uh, to make sure that they, they, he thinks about all the security requirements in the software, he makes sure that they follow the activities that have to be implemented, they have to be executed. The role of the advisor is, is really to um, make more like an audit role, to make sure that he, he uh, evaluates all the things that are being done, uh, from, from a security perspective and also you can give advice if there's a particular security, problems, uh, security problem that the team doesn't know how to address um, the advisor can, give, um, can, give, uh, can help in that, in that matter. One of the interesting things uh, that they do is uh, the bug bar. They call it the bug bar. Uh, and what is that? In the, in the beginning of the, of the project they kind of think about okay, how, again, how risky is this application to, uh, to my business and what type of bugs do we want to be fixed in the software? Is it a high financial application? We probably want to make sure that most of the bugs are being fixed. So they set this bug bar quite high. If it's a low, a low impact software, they lower the bug bar and just say, okay, for this software, it's not really important to address all the all security implementations in there. They fix it upfront when the project starts and they never change it through the, through the development life cycle of that software. Otherwise, during implementation, you can say, okay, initially it was high, but it turns out, turns out to be too difficult, so we're going to lower it to low. No, they set it up front, and then we're going to change it. Later on, at the final end, final review of the software, they're going to uh, see whether the bugs bar is actually met, and that's the moment when they decide to release the software or not, depending on that bug bar that they set now in the beginning. But yeah. No, well, it's, it's, it, con uh, it contains different, different uh, things. What, um, what type of vulnerabilities do we want to uh, address? Um, how many? It, 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 it has different, different uh, things in there, but it's, it's not one, one metric. It's, it's a set of things that they, that they, uh, that they set. <coughs> and, and another thing that they do in the requirements phase is the, of course, they, they, they uh, try to figure out what are the, um, what are the security requirements for the software, but they do also a risk analysis and a cost analysis. So they first um, identify all the security requirements and, they just, and then they, they uh, um, are evaluating whether the implementation of all that security in the software would make sense from a, from a cost perspective. If the business is willing to pay such amount of money and you're, based on your security requirements you, you, you need double the amount of money, then the project won't fly. So they do that upfront to make sure that good expectation management to make sure that when you're implementing the security, you can meet the budget of the of the project, and um, you you know what to do during the rest of the of the development of the development life cycle. Uh, during design, um, they think about. Um, functional specifications of the software and design specifications of the software. So again, this has nothing to do with secure coding best practices. Eh? How, how to prevent SQL injection? That's not here. They just think about, okay, what should the, the design look like? And are there any new requirements that come in based on the design that we create? Typically, if, you, if you've been developing software, you know that um, if you're doing upfront requirements analysis, um, you get a bunch of requirements. 
And then we, when you start thinking about the design and making, making it more concrete, a lot of extra requirements will pop up. The same is true for security. When you make things more concrete, there will be more and more security requirements coming in into the software that you're building. So there, it's, they, they think again about what are the, actually the security requirements that we should be doing and what, what would the design uh, look like. That's a basic thing. The second activity that they do is threat modeling, risk analysis. There's an, uh, a session uh, later this week uh, about threat modeling as well. So they think about what does the architecture of my software look like and what are the threats uh, that, are, that might pop up uh, in, the, in the system based on that architecture. They do that based on Stride. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar, have heard about that, Stride. It's, it's a method to just uh, elicit potential uh, vulnerabilities in the system. Um, if you're interested in threat modeling, you should definitely go to the session. I think it's given by Steven, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, it, the session on threat modeling, because there you will find a lot more explanation. You will hear a lot more explanation on how to really do threat modeling. But the basic idea is identify potential threats in your software system. During implementation, um, <coughs> they, they um, first of all, think about creating, uh, making sure that all the documentation and tools is, is, is available uh, for the users of the system. So they think about for development, but also for the users. If a system, if a user would be later on using, if you buy Microsoft uh, um, Office and you install it tomorrow, what would you uh, think about, what, what are your concerns from a security perspective? And what can you do to, uh, to install it in a secure way? What, what's the documentation that we need for that? So they, they think about it already quite in the, in the, in the beginning of, in the, in, uh, early on in the, in, the, in the life cycle of that. But during implementation, they also definitely put a lot of focus on um, what, are the, what are the coding practices that we should be using, what are the tools that we can be using. So they do, for instance, static analysis during implementation. What are the tools that we are using for static analysis? Um, are there any functions that we cannot use? Are there any, what are the coding practices? What, shouldn't, what should we do? What shouldn't we do as developer? Those kind of things are being standardized in, uh, uh, in the implementation phase and then the developers should, uh, should implement accordingly. Okay, then they come into the, the verification of test or testing phase. Um, there's two important uh, parts in that. First of all, security and privacy testing. So what they, what they do is they try to figure out does the implemented software as it stands today meet all the security problems that we, that we thought of uh, beforehand, both from a uh, security as well as from a functionality as well as from a quality perspective. So for that they typically do uh, dynamic testing, uh, first testing, these kind of things and they test uh, for, for security and for privacy. Uh, they they uh, uh, use typical QA people for that, which do a um, specific kind of, of, of testing, uh, but definitely also security, security people that do kind of pen testing for that. Eh? So they use tools and do, they, do people for, uh, they use people for, for doing the actual testing. So there's a lot of testing going on, and they, to, then to some, to some extent they know what the potential problems in the software there are. And then they're actually doing uh, something what is Microsoft specific, uh, the security push. They just reserve a couple of weeks and have all the people working on the project uh, just think about security. Architects, developers, testers, focus on security. So, so they just stop the regular development and they spend a couple of weeks doing nothing more than trying to improve the situation for security. This is definitely, in most of the organizations that I've come, I've never seen this. Typically they go on, they go on, they go on, and then just before release they figure out that there's a problem. This is really a phase where they stop, they stop everything, and they try to improve the situation. Well, it's, uh, at what stage, now it's also just before the release, if you see the number, but is it typically like during development, or...? No, it's, it's, uh, in, it's after development. After development? Yeah, after development. But, but in, in development, do already quite a bit, eh? So they, they, they do, for instance, uh, continuous static analysis to make sure that they, that they f uh, try to find the, all the typical problems like, like the, uh, the, the typical the bugs kind of things. They, they try to find that using static analysis already. The flaws, they also do that based on, on requirements analysis and threat modeling. But so once they gotten there, after, after all those activities, once they gotten here, they still 
spend quite a bit of, of, uh, of time, of effort, just on the security part. Um, and after the security push, the idea is that the, 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 the product should be in line with the requirements that they, that they set up front for, for the software. Now, this is just for release, I, I agree, uh, Alex, um, but still it's not really release yet that they're doing. Uh, you will see there's, the, there's a number of different activities uh, still going on. Um, so first of all, Microsoft is an ISV, eh? so they sell um, operating systems, they sell Office. What they typically do, there's a lot of beta testing going on. So they never, uh, Microsoft never, never releases a piece of software without, uh, without just giving it to the public to test it out and to see whether there's potential problems in there. So they, they don't immediately release the software after, after security push. Um, in fact, some of the security push and the beta testing might go, might go even, even hand in hand. They might also already um, um, publish, uh, g give, the, give the software out in, um, in beta and still work on the security, work on the security internally. Um, so they, they, uh, the, the, the pre-release um, focuses on so the beta testing. They ask actually people to, to focus on, uh, to look into the functionality of the system, but also the security and the privacy. And for them, for Microsoft itself, the focus is mostly on, on uh, is, is a lot of on privacy, because privacy is becoming more and more important and they want to get that covered. Uh, and they also typically ask people, okay, what about, what about the privacy? Is there any problems in the software that you see that you think we should, we should cover? Uh, so that's the, that's the beta testing. What they also do before releasing the software is planning. And the planning phase uh, relates to everything that's, that's related to incident response planning. So whenever after the release a potential vulnerability comes in, what should you, what should you do? Who should you contact? What's the process for dealing with this? All these kind of things, they, they uh, have a plan ready before releasing that software. And that's this planning phase that they're doing. Mm -hmm. Even before release, then they're doing the final security review, FSR. They take everything together, they look at all the activities, all the outcomes. Do these activities and do the outcomes actually meet what we've set up front? And here is the bug bar again coming up. Eh? So we've set initially the bug bar. Now when, when the, the, project, all, the project product is almost being shipped, they see, okay, how much do we reach? What are the problems still available? Um, and is this, is this feasible to ship or not? And this is part of the final security review. And only when that is passed, uh, they, will, they will actually release uh, the code. So, Alex, um, the, the security push, there's still quite a bit of activities going after, afterwards. But I, I, I agree that it's, it's rather late, but it's not the only activity that they do. Eh? They do a lot of activities before, before that already. Okay, important. They have the responsibilities. The responsible persons also have to sign off. They have to sign things, and later on when there's a problem and it turns out that they didn't really follow the standard practices that they should have been following, then there's, then there's a problem, of course. That's one of the things that's often lacking in organizations. Eh? Responsibility for security. It's, uh, it's often, for, for application development, it's often not there. There's no people really responsible for that. Uh, one of the important things in, in, uh, in Microsoft SDL. <clears throat> if you're delivering software in your organization, who is responsible for security in your organization, for application security? Generally the team. The? The team, the project team. The project team. But, and, and is there one, a single person responsible or is it a group or? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's generally embedded in the project. Okay. Or it should be embedded from the start in the project. So, yeah. Um, yeah. But it's it's difficult to say, eh? It's it's my organization doesn't work like that. Okay, yeah, it really depends on yeah. Yeah. But in most organizations where I where I come, it's very difficult to pinpoint one person that gets blamed when there's a problem in the software. Eh? And that's a problem, eh? <laughs> if, if, if no one gets blamed, yeah, who's going to take care? Who, who's going to make sure that it's secure? No one. Eh? I think it depends because our customer is, okay, it's for, it's for public transport, so hmm? maybe I have security requirements for a bit amount, but I think for more like 
the, the bugs you say, it's mm -hmm. more like development, but if it's really security functionality, mm -hmm. it's also the architecture team because they should envision it that it has to be built. Yeah. It's so there is a distinction between the Yeah. Yeah, that's that's true. I often there there, but, but I often there will be different types of roles um, that that are involved in the software development. Eh? But still, um, okay, if you have like ten people that are potentially responsible, yeah, who are you going to ask when there's a problem in the software? Who are you going to to talk to? The ten. One of those ten. Who exactly? If there's a SQL injection problem in there, are you going to talk to the architect or to the developer or to the to, to the manager? It's typically that's 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 one of the one of the problems in 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 secure in, in security in in general. Eh? It's not only about software, but it's definitely there for software. That is why it's it's not as structured as then. It's it's this is why it's very interesting to have people like I say that will live with the application. Yeah, exactly. So it is. A, a general purpose involvement that somebody or, or action that uh, you have an other eye yeah. uh, on, on. Now, I, I fully agree it is unstructured because generally they look at uh, to uh, fault tolerance or, or, or these kind of aspects and, and security is, is not uh, a major aspect that they look at. Yeah, when they look at it, they typically will probably will look at availability because they will get blamed quite rapidly when the software is down. But the other the other uh, aspects of, of security, it's it's uh, it's often uh, less less covered. Availability is typically one thing that's in organization this is, is v very well aware of. This is why <coughs> what I liked here was uh, uh, to prepare reaction incident reaction yeah. scenarios. Yeah. Yeah. Is a very good way to get uh, a development team aware of the issue because it's an education process. Yeah, exactly, definitely. Yeah, and actually, application because they what they do in this planning phase, they assign uh, different persons as well. Eh? And so, wh what happens when a vulnerability comes in? Actually, you should have a team of a developer, a tester, different roles that are available when a vulnerability comes in to make sure that you can have a rapid reaction to that. Uh, to that, to that incident, uh, and that's what they do indeed in this planning to make sure that they have the different uh, people available to to to, to address that. Did okay. Also it isn't always easy to have one single responsible because, for instance, um, in some cases you you have to like for public transport you have to comply with standards. With respect to security, mm -hmm. this is how the contracts are written on smart media, etc. Mm -hmm. okay, that they can be exploits with respect to that, but that's not something that that, uh, that an organization can decide upon itself to change. So you have to comply to the standard also with respect to security, and then of course if a vulnerability um, is detected, then it's a lot more complicated on okay, who, is, who should take, undertake what action. Or if, because it's not, you can't say, okay, we deviate from the standard because we know that there are some security risks there. Mm -hmm. the, the standard should be uh, adapted mm -hmm. and patched and everybody should do you, you mean the standard being uh, an internal standard or a so regulation for or... For instance, there are rules um, um, with respect to how to securely write uh, a contract or a, a pub for taking public transport, like a day pass on a smart medium. Mm -hmm. So that for instance diff different operators can read and write such contracts. Mm -hmm. Okay, the security mechanisms to do that, they are specified in standards. Yeah. Which of course, okay, uh, if a vulnerability really applies to the core of the standard, then yeah, the, as a supply so, so it, it, it depends on where it can be in that case it's totally out of control even for an organization because it it, it, it applies sure. to a piece, so I think, yeah, you can have different, some parts are in your control, but I think the same question, like if you have third-party software, mm -hmm. it's also a bit more out of your own control. Yeah. Yeah, maybe, maybe then you have still a choice, but in some cases you're managed. It's mandatory to comply with certain security standards. Yeah, definitely, definitely. But in the end, security is, um, is, a, is a business decision. Yeah. 
you don't do security for the sake of security in organization. You do security because it's important to business. Eh? If, if, if you have an application like, like the, the, the application that you're saying, and you're able to uh, misuse the cards, then, then the organization has a problem. Eh? So why do you do security? To protect your organization. So if you have a regulation and you have to comply with that regulation, it's up to the organization to decide whether or not to do it. But also that is a business decision. You have to take that decision consciously. You, yeah, if you don't know about the standard or just ignore it, then you have a problem. But if you know, okay, here, this is a standard, but this is a risk and we're going to do it otherwise, you have to take that decision and someone has to take that responsibility. If you don't do that, then you have a problem. And that's the point, the, the, it's taking the responsibility for, for security and it should be somewhere in the organization embedded. And that's, it's a difficult one. Mm -hmm. How is it possible that they put some software on the market with big uh, vulnerabilities? I mean, each month there is an alert on Microsoft mm -hmm. for a vulnerability. Mm -hmm. So how is it possible when we see all this? Like, is it because it would cost too much to fix it during this? Um, the, it, there might be also, also Microsoft is an organization and they also have the, the, also their security is a, is, a, is a business decision. So in some situation it will be definitely be the case that the business decides, okay we know that there's this list of security vulnerabilities but we, we sign for it and ship it. I'm, I'm pretty sure that will happen. Yeah, exactly. I'm pretty sure that that will happen. They just have to take the, take the, the consequence, I the, do the calculation. Okay, if that bug is being discovered, how will it impact our clients and how will it impact us as an organization? And they have to, they have to figure that out. And in some cases they will say this is not acceptable. And in some cases they, that's what this final security review is for. So there's a number of remaining security things that they know of. And they just have to take decision, are we going to go to release it or not? Really yeah, but that's a part of the, of the answer. Another part of the answer is, I'm pretty sure that they, do, for, for a number of vulnerabilities, they, ju they just don't know. Eh? Mm -hmm. Software is so complex to build, they just don't know that the vulnerabilities are in there. Even with all their efforts, eh? because they, Microsoft has a lot of effort to try to figure out in an automated way, in a manual way, to figure out all vulnerabilities in software. But an, an, a, micro, an, an, a Windows, an operating system product. It's, it's so, so, so complex. You, you, can, uh, you, you, need, you need an entire team to try to figure out more or less what the software, uh, what the coherence between the software is, try to find vulnerabilities in there. It's, 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 it's huge, eh? enormous. So I think the, the, complex, the more complex the software, the, the more difficult it gets to, to find vulnerabilities in there. So I'm pretty sure, pretty convinced that they just, for a number of these, they just don't know. And that's, that's a pity, but that's, that's, that's a fact of life. And that's also why they, for them the incident, incident planning is so important. Because they know that things will, will happen. And they just have to make sure that they can react quickly to, to incoming, incoming incidents. That's, that's, an internal, that's an internal thing. Eh? It's, not a, it's not an official label. It's, an, uh, yeah. it's an internal thing. I, th I think, in my opinion, it's, it's a good idea to have, uh, yeah, at least every organization should have a single a security contact point. Uh, but but I'm, I'm not convinced that that should be the point for all application vulnerabilities. In my opinion, it's better to assign a, partic a particular person that is responsible for security per application or per group of applications or whatever. Um, because as, as, a, as a general CISO, eh, a chief, a chief information security officer, you often don't know what the application is about. So if you receive a particular uh, incident or whatever, it's often very difficult to understand what's going on. A person that is linked with the application will much better know how to, how to respond to that. So I think it's, it's, uh, you often have um, application responsibles. That's, that's more the case in organizations that, 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 that's there. It, it should be interesting to assign a security responsible aside from that as well, in my, in my opinion. 
It's a dedicated role, but not per application. Eh? It can be per group of applications or, well, no, it's, it's, not, a, it's not a dedicated role in the sense that um, you can have, an, uh, say, a, a, dev, a dev lead. Eh? A dev lead could be a potential candidate to be the security responsible for a particular application because he knows very well what the application is about and he knows how to react on security questions or on security incidents. So it's not necessarily a dedicated role, but it's at least interesting to have some kind of person in that, in that sense. Okay, and then there's the yeah, incident response. Yeah. I heard you, uh, I heard you say that um, uh, 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 someone like a dev lead might be in security responsibility. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, 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 a little bit earlier you told us, yes, uh, but security is really a business requirement. Mm -hmm. Because it's, it's a business decision. Is that not contradictory? Uh, uh, when I look at my organization, I often see that, uh, uh, like you say, uh, dev leads or, or, or whatever are responsible for security and that they are often defending this security viewpoint against the business. Yeah. And uh, that's, that's uh, an eternal conflict yeah. because the, the business often does not have enough Technology, uh, well, technology knowledge to, 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 exactly. to assess business, uh, to assess uh, security uh, issues, etc. And, and uh, it, it's, it's often a conflictual situation yeah. and, and they... It's a very good point. Um, I think the, 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 final, the final decision uh, whether you address a particular vulnerability um, if, it's, if it's sufficiently large mm -hmm. should, uh, should lie with business. Hey, organizations, most organizations are structured in business, IT, and some other services. If that's the case, not all organizations like that, but if that's the case, then I think the final decisions would rather lie in, in, in business. The guys with, with, who pay for the software being built. Uh, but that's not to say that the security responsible should be there. Why is that? Because often business cannot, doesn't understand what the problem is. And if you're going to make them responsible in first hand, they will just say, oh, this doesn't seem important to me, or this does seem important and maybe it's totally not important at all, and they don't have enough inf information to do that. So rather, in my opinion, the final decision should be taken by business, but the responsible, that's a different story. I would, lie, I would, I would um, um, put that responsibility rather in the, the, the technical organization, the IT organization, rather than in the business organization. But the, you have to have both, eh? you have to have both, that's clear, indeed, I agree. Yeah, I'm, I'm convinced of that. I'm, co I'm really convinced of that. Yeah, yeah, I'm really convinced that if, if, if business would be uh, more aware of the potential risks of software, there would be more room for... Yeah, yeah. Often, often the, 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 the experience that I have is often they don't really realize what the risks are with it. And so as an IT organization, you have to uh, challenge them, you have to explain them. Uh, because otherwise, often they, they, they don't, they, they insufficiently realize it, unfortunately. Um, but that's also, hey, it's typical business IT aligned problem. Eh? It's not, all, not only about security, it's, it's about, about, yeah, it's about other things as, as well. Eh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's the, that's the alignment, business and IT alignments, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a a large debate as well, and it's, an, it's a difficult debate as well. But software uh, security um, is, is very much linked to that, I think. So, okay, um, that was the Microsoft model. Um, I, I will have to speed up uh, a bit. Uh, to, wrap, to wrap this up, um, Microsoft is, is a very mature and long experienced model. I think it's a very good model. Um, if you're thinking about uh, improving situation, um, it, 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 it's definitely worthwhile to take a look into it. Uh, it's being claimed to be rather heavyweight, and I think I agree with that. So remember, you have all these activities, you have to comply with all of them to be Microsoft SDL compliant. Uh, in some cases, it's not all relevant to do them. It, it might depend on the organization. Um, the Microsoft themselves offers quite a bit of supporting tools and methods, also on their website. To, so they have threat modeling tools, other kinds of tools to help you with that. Uh, but it's definitely not the only model. Um, there's other process models that exist, pros and cons. 
uh, in general, uh, this statement applies that there's no process that will perfectly fit your, your organization. You'll always have to adapt it, mix and match a bit, take different elements from different process models. It will be very difficult. One example, for instance, also um, is agile development. Yes, and this was a topic I wanted to raise. Okay, okay. <laughs> Let's... Um, sure, I don't know when it fits in your presentation. Yeah, I will, I will speed up and I will make some time for that. It's wonderful. I know. I know. Actually, they have. Um, I will. I will give already a bit of a, a bit a, a, a tip of the. Um, it's difficult. That's the first thing. Agile is more difficult. Why? Because it's so dynamic. Yeah, it's very dynamic. Um, but people have been studying this uh, already quite a number of years. Um, Microsoft, for instance, they have a, a guideline on how to do uh, SDL in Agile. And what they do is they, distingu they, they um, di distinguish between uh, sprint activities, bucket activities, which are, which are a set of sprints, and then one-time activities. And so they take the, the initial model that you've seen and they just say, per sprint you should be doing this. Per set of sprints you should be doing that. And at the initial phase of a project you just should be doing this and that. Um, but but it's, it's, it's more difficult it's more difficult. The fact is that you, in every sprint you have requirements and you, it always changes and it's, it's just more dynamic which makes it by definition from a security perspective more, di more difficult to do. But we can talk about it um, 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 later in the session. So well, I will uh, continue, speed up a little and then we have uh, room for discussion. Uh, maturity models. Uh, so wh 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 why do we need maturity models? Um, first thing is um, it's, it's, it's a bad idea to implement it in a, in a big bang way. Eh? So you have a, so, so take the SDL for instance, if you would tomorrow go to your organization and say, okay, I'm going to apply SDL, okay, here are 16 activities from day after tomorrow, we're going to all do this, very bad idea, it won't work. What we need is kind of a way how to get there. And a maturity model is a way how to know where you are today and how to get, how to know where you're going tomorrow. That's a maturity model, actually, because you're, you're actually evaluating the current state and how, how you can improve that. Uh, second thing is, I've said that before, uh, there's no model that will fit your organization perfectly. You will always have to adapt. And if Microsoft says, these are the 16 acti activities that you should implement, maybe there's only 14 that work for you and the other two are not relevant, that's also a bit of a maturity model. Maturity model, you have different buckets, you have different uh, domains, and you can choose for yourself where I want to be top, top class and where I don't want to do anything at all. That's also about maturity modeling. And for that, for that a maturity model is, is very well suited to, to have that kind of um, different, different uh, quality of implementation of, of, um, of, uh, of activities. Um, okay, let's go into it. I will take one example. There are several. I will take uh, OpenSAM, which is um, uh, a model that's available via, via OWASP. Um, it has been defined in 2009. It's, it's fully available. SDL, by the way, as well. Eh? You can fully download SDL. It's, it's, it's all open. Uh, it's not the, the latest mo model, probably, that they're using internally, but it's very recent. The last, latest model is of 2012, I think, so it's, it's very recent. Uh, OpenSAM is, uh, in my opinion, a very, uh, very interesting one. Um, it might have to do with the fact that I'm also uh, involved in the, in the project as well. Uh, but that's totally objective opinion. Yeah. Okay, so what's the core structure of these models or, or of, of OpenSAM? Actually, they distinguish between four uh, business functions. These business functions are typically things that you see in an organization that's, that have to be done. So you have to build software, you have to test software, you have to deploy software, and you have to make sure that it aligns with, with, with the strategy. And in these business functions, there's different practices. So each, each business function has three practices. And actually, in these practices, there are several activities that you could be doing. And that's actually where the maturity is coming from. So you have actually 12 buckets of things that you can be doing. One bucket for strategy, one bucket for how to do security requirements, how to do security testing. And in all of these buckets, there's different activities that you can be doing. And those activities actually determine your uh, maturity as an organization for secure software development. So that's the basic, um, the basic uh, setup of these models. 
I'm not going to explain uh, all these, all these uh, activities because we don't have enough time, but also here the model is open, uh, so, so look into it. Maybe what's already interesting to say is that um, compared to SDL, uh, what you see here, for instance, security requirements, architecture, threat assessment, that's all in SDL. But environment hardening, how should your uh, application server be hardened to make sure that you don't have problems there? It's typically something that you don't really see in an SDL. Um, vulnerability management, how to do vulnerability management, you have the incident response planning, but what's the process behind it? How is the organization prepared for that? It's typically something that you don't have really in, uh, in an SDL. So in that sense, a maturity model is a bit broader in scope than a process model. And if you think back about um, the cornerstones of SDL, uh, maturing models typically cover, um, cover other, other dimensions uh, than pure, purely the process, while process models are more, a bit more focused towards the, towards the process part. Okay, so what's maturity? Um, in some, maturity is def defined as the following. There's three levels and, and, and a void level. So you don't do anything or you do it initially uh, better and you master it. That's basically the bottom line. So how do you define then how you, um, what, what level you are? Per uh, security function, so per bucket of activities, you, you, you evaluate uh, what activities are being implemented in the organization. And based on, so all activities are linked to a particular level. So in every security function, you have activities linked to level one, level two, and level three. If you do all activities level one, you get a, a grade of one for that particular security function. If you do all activities for level two, you will get a two. And so if you do all of one and some of two, you will get a one plus, something in between. And so for all these 12 security functions, you then evaluate how well the organization um, scores related to the different um, activities that you can be doing. Um, one, in my opinion, what, what um, the, the maturity is at the moment, it's not really always an, uh, an improvement in, in, um, in quality. Not always. It are, just, it are at the moment different activities and they feel like being better, but it's not always the case that you, um, if you're in level, suppose you're doing an activity in level one, it can be the case that you're doing it in a very lousy way. While doing it activity three, you can do it in a very high, a very, very good way. Or vice versa, you can do an activity in level three in a very lousy way, and activity in level one in a very, very good way. There's no real m m m a method behind the model currently to make that distinction. It's just, are you doing activity, yes or no? Okay, just one example. Again, the model is available, uh, have a look at it. Code review. We have level one, two, and three. In level one, we have two activities, create review checklists and perform uh, um, co code review. Level two is use tools, use automated tools, and integrate code analysis into the process. And level three is customize the tools for your specific rules and make sure you have a release gate. So a, a checkpoint to make sure that you, you did it the right way. So the further you go, the more advanced the activities are that, you, that you're implementing with the model. Um, <clears throat> OpenSum is not only about activities, uh, which is I think a very nice thing about the model as well. It's also about um, measuring, for instance. How do you measure where you're doing, when you're doing something well? Um, for, um, wait, eh? for security testing, for instance, a metric could be 50% of the projects are using security testing customizations. That could be a potential metric. And so the model also defines how can you measure success in your organization. It, can, it also gives some indications on what would the cost be to implement a particular activity and what's the personnel that you, that you need it for. So it, it's much, it's, it, the model is kind of, it's, it's nicely structured in the sense that you have activities but also accompanying information to, to know how to implement it and what would the impact on the on the business on, or on the organization. So what you typically do with the model is you do an assessment um, based on the organization. So you take all the, the security functions, all the activities, you see are the, is the organization doing it or not? And you, you do that. And then you have this kind of a scorecard per organization, strategy and metrics, 
currently I score two, and actually I would like to go to, to three. That's, that's the idea of the maturity model. So you do the, the, the ASIS evaluation, where am I currently, and where do I want to go? And that's really what, what the maturity model is, is, is meant for, is built for. Five minutes, okay, that's a problem. Yep. So what's this maturity model based on? Did it, is it based on actual measurements with respect to the success, with respect to security then? And that you then it's, it's, it's based on the activities that you're doing. Okay, but who came up with, came up with the list? Is it some sort of interrogation of a lot of companies and that you say, okay... Yeah, there's different ways how, to, how they did that. Um, in this model, uh, they came up based on experiences that they had. Yeah? And experts yeah, yeah. And they sit together, they say what are the typical things that we should be doing. Uh, there's other models, like BSIM is an, ex an example, a good example of that. They, there they, what they do is they, uh, they question uh, a lot of organizations, what are you doing? And based on that, they put together the model. So it's a totally different way of, it, this is more like a theoretical setup. Well, the other is more like a, pragma, uh, a, pra a practical experience-based uh, experience setup. Okay, uh, we have five more minutes, um, which is um, not enough time to... Uh, it's short. It's, which is very short. <laughs> uh, so, well, what... Yeah, okay. What should we spend five or ten more minutes on, on discussion? And uh, would that be the most interesting thing? Um, or continue this or it's 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 up to you guys we can we can have a bit of discussion about outsourcing agile other topics no the 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 third party software it was eh? yeah it was not outsourcing third party software yeah outsourcing outsourcing is also a very good there you're opening a can of worms exactly <laughs> exactly so the third party <laughs> You will sleep. <laughs> yeah. Um, in general, there's there's uh, there's definitely companies doing 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 work in that uh, in this. So that's that's for sure. The question is, how can you as an organization um, evaluate or make sure that the other company is doing it? There's different ways how you can do that. Um, first of all, um, often um, what you could do is, is in the contract that you're doing with the company, include that. That's not so easy to do. But actually at OWASP, for instance, there are example contracts where you could state um, what you, you expect from the other party in terms of security. And I think actually more and more organizations are looking into that. When, when um, I work for a number, a number of organizations and we try to implement, uh, to include some of these, uh, it's not really liability clauses, but it's delivery clauses. So upon delivery of the software, what to expect? And you typically upon delivery, you can test that. You can test a piece of software and see whether the software meets it. The liability clauses are much harder. That's I, 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 I haven't seen it a lot in, 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 so security liability, I mean, I haven't seen it a lot in practice. Um, that will be really hard to do, I think. But uh, the delivery uh, the clauses can be in there. So what do you expect and, and what is, uh, what is um, and, and you can test that based on, based on delivery. Another model that you can take, which is, I think, interesting, and it's, it's, um, it can be for third-party independent development, but also for development that you're doing um, shared. So you have one party, one set of developers in your own organization, one set of developers in your organization, and you're doing sh uh, shared shared development. Um, one thing you can do is, is uh, follow the SDS, SDL model and just say, look, during uh, requirements or during design phase, we expect from you that you do this and this and this, and at the end of the phase, show us that you did it. So that's really going through the SDL and making sure that at the end of each phase the, 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 the third party developer uh, just shows you what they've done for security and whether that meets your requirements or not. So that's not really on delivery, which is be it's better to do it during the life cycle, but it, it's, it's more complex eh? because you really have to in advance state what, what, what you expect per phase and how they should be doing it. And typically the, the tools that they, the methods that they use at the third party are different than your methods, so you have to align this. Um, Again, I think we're back to the, what people are saying earlier, that business 
is not aware of security issues or, or, or risks, mm -hmm. then buy software that is not secure or yeah. it's not secure enough. Yeah. Yeah, but is is uh, it? It also depends. Is IT involved when they buy software or not? Eh? Sometimes it is the case. Sometimes it's not the case. That's what I see in practice. Often when it's not the case, there's a big hey, there are yeah. bigger holes than when it is the case. But yeah, 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 yeah. But but but, but as a bank, you can definitely. I think you can definitely as a first step look into the <laughs> delivery requirements. Eh? What do you expect? And that should be feasible to do. Yeah, maybe the process is, it could also be impose a, a risk. Because if you impose a particular process on your supplier, okay, there, he currently has an established way of working, there is a transition in which certainly things will go wrong or so. And I don't know whether it's always a good idea to, to impose the a new process, it, it, it's not a guarantee for having <coughs> but it's No, but the, 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 I don't think it's, it's, it's about imposing a process. I, I think it's just about... Deliverables are agreed. Exactly. How, how you come to them, yeah, you care, exactly. but you have to prove that... Yeah. I, you cannot is different. Yeah, that you cannot impose, but you can at least say, uh, threat model, yeah. I want at the end of the, the architectural yeah. phase that you deliver us the threat model. How do you do it? We don't care, but we want to see it. Because that's, that, that way we are uh, sure that you thought about it. And, and, and it's, it's more in terms of that, I, I think, that it, it will work. Imposing a process, that's, that's really difficult, I think. I'm always, when I see like maturity models and so I'm always a bit skeptical because it often leads to cargo cult where, where people, they apply something without really understanding or knowing how to, because I know, yeah, I'm not a good cook, a good cook, but I saw this study and they say that all cooks which have a uh, mission I start, they wear a white skirt. I have a brown skirt, so I buy a white skirt, yeah. and now I cook yeah. better meals. And yeah. not, so there's no, not always a causal relation, it's more like a correlation, but... Yeah. I have, a, I have a very interesting um, slide on that, um, but th th this is BSIM, so the model I was explaining that uh, asks organizations. Eh? And what they did is, they, uh, at the moment they have uh, evaluated 50, around 50 companies, and they just say, what are the, the number of organizations that are doing a particular activity? Uh, and there's, wait, what's the, the, the testing? You have security, wait, a static analysis, where was it? Um, one, not four. I think uh, this one, the code review, that are the use of static analysis tools. So 33 out of 50 use of the companies they interviewed use static analysis tools in their, in their, in their, uh, in their environment. Now, static analysis tools, it's great but it already quite, it, uh, requires quite a bit of uh, maturity in the organization to be able to use it. If you're in an initial stage of a maturity model, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's difficult to cope with all the things that come out of these tools. But so apparently, um, that the, the, most, um, the, the yellows are the, the activities that are most done in a particular category of activities. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, the, that's the top activity for code review in an organization. And that, that makes me also think, yeah, is our organizations already really ready to have that? Eh? Or are just buying a tool, putting it there, and then the, the results are coming out, they are like enormous, and what do they do with it? We don't know. So that's, that's that, that story, I think. Indeed, you should, you should always think about what's, why, what's useful for me, and it's really the, the best thing to do at the current situation where I'm in as an organization. You need to measure whether if you change your process or if you include a new activity that the security, um, the security of the systems you build will be better. So mm -hmm. you need a set of metrics. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and then in, in a sense it becomes like yeah, a bit of trial and error, see what you can do, what you, how you can improve, yeah. but at least you can objectively measure the yeah. output of yeah. the whole. There are, uh, there are metrics, but it's not standard set. Uh, there is a number of good books about that. 
uh, but typically metrics what you should what you that would you would use are uh, process metrics and application metrics process metrics are how many people uh, follow training how many uh, projects do actually thread modeling that's typically process metrics and then application metrics are more like okay how many vulnerabilities are there how many high risk vulnerabilities are there per per application for instance and it's a, it's a set of metrics that you should be building as an organization and you should be building that as soon as possible because that are really providing you with the arguments to, to invest to invest in security and if you, if it turns out that there's typically a, a huge bunch of, of uh, high risk vulnerabilities of software then you have at, le at least figures often organizations at the moment they don't have figures and it's really very we're secure or we're not secure but it's really very difficult to to give uh, qualitative objective arguments about that. So that's one of the first things that I always uh, advise, start measuring as soon as possible. Even it's just three simple metrics, eh? but do it as soon as possible, that you have some, some uh, information about that. Are there any, any guidelines or metrics or models on how to assess open source software? Because if you are buying something on a third party, there's something, someone who you can actually make an agreement with, but in an open source context, the software is there and as, as an organization, you've got to judge that software, is yeah. it okay or is it not okay from a security perspective? What, what you typically see in these models is that they, um, they, um, one of the activities in there will, will be uh, standard libraries, mm -hmm. standard software. So what, what I think is a good thing as an organization is decide on what are the op all open source libraries or tools, applications, whatever that I can use mm -hmm. and before you make them approved or standard, verify them to some extent. Mm -hmm. um, that's, I think, the best thing that you can do as an organization for open source. Don't allow everything, but you, because you don't really know what you're, what you're dealing with, but it, when, when a library is useful, yeah, why not, why not use it? But th th that, uh, before using it, try to make sure that you know uh, to some extent that it's a good library or not, and then make it, it a standard library. Spread that as a standard library throughout the organization and then you start using it. But then you have some control over what's going on in open source. That's, that's the thing that, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's, that's implemented often in organizations. And are there any guidelines about which aspects are checked on, 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 on open source software? There are, uh, there are stuff like, uh, uh, well, uh, you, you call it maturity, uh, but they are essentially process release, but if you only have the product, there, there must be some way on how to evaluate it. I, I would, I would uh, evaluate it from, um, if you're talking only about security, mm -hmm. I, would, I would evaluate it uh, looking at um, the code and looking at the dynamic behavior. Okay. So do a, a, a very quick source code check and do a dynamic check to see how it behaves. And, and based on that, you can already say quite a bit. Eh? Yeah, yeah, but also look at the code because looking at the code, it will already give you an indication of is it really a mess the code? Then it's probably not a good idea to use the library, or is it well structured? And is it uh, is it uh... also? I think what is very important in open source is the the activeness of the of the project, eh? because it's often the case that there's a library of 2009, but it's not maintained. Yeah, then you should really think about as an organization, is it useful to use this or not? Eh? Okay. Yeah, so that's a very important one in open source. Whereas you don't think of that, I only use feature X, but in the same component, feature Y is also provided and it's very unsafe. Mm -hmm. Or it at least provides an additional risk that it can be accessed. Yeah. Okay, I, I, I think we have to close down the session. Sorry for not, um, for, for, uh, not covering all the, all the material that I wanted to. But if there are any discussion topics that you might have, uh, come, come, uh, come talk to me or just contact me and mail me. We can, we can discuss this further. Yeah, it's on the website. Yeah, it's on the site. Yeah. Okay, thank you.